Hello. In this presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about problem solving and how that might differ between experts and novices and a technique for us in computer science to help um, our novice student pro programmers become experts. So um, we'll start off just at, by talking a little bit about the differences between experts and novices and um, how that applies to the problem solving process as well as um, talking about that strategy I mentioned for algorithmic problem solving, um, worked examples with sub-goal labels. So uh, this text, uh, this book, How People Learn, is a great summary of a lot of the educational research out there on how people learn. If you haven't seen it before, I highly recommend that you um, pick it up and take a look through it. There is a free online copy, so if you just search for the How People Learn uh, title, you should be able to find access to it. Um, the quote that I've pulled here is from chapter two that talks about the differences between experts and novices. So experts have acquired extensive knowledge that affects what they notice and how they organize, represent, and interpret information in their environment. This in turn affects their abilities to remember, reason, and solve problems. So we're going to talk about um, some of those key differences here. And our ultimate goal, you know, in thinking about ourselves as educators is to help move our students from along that um, continuum from novice towards being more of an expert. And one of the uh, difficulties is really that experts, when you talk to them about how they solve problems, maybe aren't recognizing all of the steps that they put into solving a problem and being able to articulate those clearly. And so we want to set up strategies for students um, to be able to solve problems that will help them um, understand what experts do to solve, solve problems. All right, so these are some of the uh, six principles that are in that how people learn about um, experts' knowledges. I'm just going to focus on the first four as they're most relevant to us in talking about problem solving. So first, experts notice features and meaningful patterns of information that are not noticed by novices. Experts have acquired a great deal of content knowledge that is organized in ways that reflect a deep understanding of their subject matter. Experts' knowledge cannot be reduced to sets of isolated facts or propositions, but instead reflects context of applicability. That is, the knowledge is conditionalized on a set of circumstances. And finally, experts are able to flexibly retrieve important aspects of their knowledge with little attentional effort. There's two more there, um, but the, like I said, these first four are the ones that focus um, primarily on how experts approach problem solving. So we're going to take a little bit deeper look at each of those and then move on to the strategy pieces. So meaningful patterns, experts notice features and meaningful patterns of information that are not noticed by novices. Typically experts can chunk information into these uh, patterns much more easily than novices, that they've seen more types, more problems and are able to recognize um, that problem type faster when they start to look at it. Um, another difference between experts and novices is that if you talk to novices and talk to experts who look at the same problem, novices are focusing on different information in the problem. And so we want to think about how we can focus that novice attention on the key information um, or provide them guides to help them focus on that so they start to recognize those patterns better. So we want them... Um, you know, the goal is to help them recognize those patterns and to be able to elucidate or identify those patterns to them more easily. Um, organization of knowledge. I won't read the, the principle there, but experts can identify big ideas, ideas versus just facts and figures. So when they are looking at a problem, they focus on those big ideas instead of just those superficial attributes of the various facts and figures. They're focusing on those um, underlying principles for the discipline. They also, um, experts have established better organizing and relationships of ideas over time so that they can see the connections between different pieces of knowledge and how those ideas and principles relate to each other. So some strategies we can use here, things we want to focus on, providing students time to develop those big ideas and organi organizational structures. You know, it takes time to really focus on the concept rather than just applying a, um, you know, particular algorithm to a problem. So we want them, to, we want to make it sure we're spending some time on helping students recognize those big ideas and how they're related to each other. And we can do that in part by organizing our curricula to focus or emphasize those big ideas rather than the facts that are present. 
The next one is context of applicability. So this all has to do, um, or this relates to being able to know when to apply certain principles um, or facts, be able to retrieve those in relationship to what you're working on. So experts are very efficient at this. They can see a context or a set of circumstances and understand um, much more quickly than novices what it is that is relevant knowledge to that particular problem. So we want to, as we're working um, with students, help them learn when, where, and why we're using the knowledge that they are learning. Um, one of the strategies that we can use to help them do that is to mix, mix up our problem types so that the students um, are constantly having to reevaluate which strategy they use to solve problems. For example, if I'm teaching a chapter about arrays, I want to make sure that I'm including not just problems about arrays, let's see if I gave the students worksheets, but I've also got a mix of problems from previous concepts, so making sure that I've got some things that um, talk about conditions, that I've got some things that um, talk about maybe while loops in there. So I'm mixing up those problem types so that it forces students to go back and revisit their previous knowledge and think a, um, a little more deliberately about what problem solving strategy or um, what pattern they should be applying for that particular problem on the worksheet. So um, otherwise if you give them just problems with arrays then they automatically are saying oh I need to you know use what I know about arrays and nothing else to solve problems so that when they see something out of context in the sense of um, you know, on an exam or somewhere else at the end of a unit, um, end of a semester, or in a real world, they're not struggling to select the appropriate, you know, algorithmic pattern to solve a problem. And finally, um, just talk a little bit about attentional effort. So novices may require lots of effort to retrieve information, and that is the slower part of the problem solving process for them. We can help students um, provide them some, you know, guides, help them uh, with, you know, study sheets to help them make that retrieval faster. Um, if you look at the timing, the amount of time it takes experts and novices to solve problems, you might think that experts would take few uh, less amount of time. Some cases that might be true, but um, when you look at the time that experts and novices spend on different parts of the problem solving process, you'll see that experts may spend more time on understanding the problem, but take less time in other areas of problem solving where they're trying to, you know, figure out what's the appropriate algorithm to use here, etc. So they're going to take more time upfront on understanding so that they know the big idea or concept that they should be using to address the problem um, later on, and then they can quickly apply that to it. All right, your book mentions a resource and it kind of goes through a similar um, process for problem solving in terms of thinking about it for computer science, especially for um, this algorithmic problem solving really focuses on the coding side of computer science, but can be applied in varying, varying ways for, for other areas, say for solving uh, data problems or creating a web page or things along those lines. So the first step is to read and understand the problem statement to really know what is being asked for and make sure that you understand all the components of it. The second part, selecting theoretical concepts that may be applied. And the third, qualitative description of the problem. The fourth, formal formalization of a so solution strategy. And finally, test and describe the solution. So a little bit of time to reflect on whether or not this, the solution is correct and how it works. Um, this comes from, like I said, it's a resource that was cited in the book and comes from the website that's linked on the page. When you look at it, he has um, structured this as a, fl um, a flow chart. So you see the first part, read the statement, and then it says guide one. Well, these guides that are in there periodically are a set of questions to help students um, answer or know whether or not they're done with each of these stages. So I'm just going to show you the guide on um, for the first one on the next page. But I think these guiding questions are a really nice tool that could also be used with students. So again, the guide one sits between reading the statement, which is understanding the problem, and then identifying concepts and assumptions that are needed, which is part of the analysis and search of conceptual tools um, stage. So these are those guiding questions for the first one. Um, do you understand every word used within the problem statement? So there may be some vocabulary issues if you're applying the problem to a specific discipline. They may not have the um, vocab that goes with that discipline. 
what computational elements are relevant to the problem, what non-computational elements are the relevant to the problem. Use your own words to describe it. Make a drawing. I ask my students to do that often, um, especially if they want to think about, you know, what memory looks like for a computer program to draw that out. Uh, think about solving any similar pro problems. If so, pull those up, have those ready to go, look at the patterns that were there. What data or resources are provided within the statement? What data or results are requested within the statement? So they, these are kind of looking um, in part at inputs and output. What information are you given and what do you have to produce? And then finally check answers 6 and 7 and decide if they're consistent with your answers for 2 and 3 in terms of computational and non-computational elements. So these guided questions I think help to um, help novices understand the process that experts are using in understanding a problem. So they lay it out um, clearly, the thinking that goes into problem understanding. And if we can get students to practice thinking about those questions, then it, they'll come more naturally and more, uh, quickly to them as they start to solve problems. One example I said that I wanted to go through with you um, for helping students really identify a process for solving problems um, and to get them to understand the process that somebody is using is worked examples with sub goals. So first let me just um, walk through what a worked example is. Basically it's a step-by-step -step demonstration of how to solve a problem and you've probably watched a hundred of these videos as part of um, the computer science program here. So the teacher is walking through how to solve a problem um, such as writing a method in a class, right? Um, when they walk through that work to ex um, that example, when they work it out for you and show what they're doing, um, that is structured scaffolding because it can lead to the student being able to write that method or that um, type of programming problem on their own later on. Um, it reduces the cognitive load during skill acquisition. If you haven't heard of it before, cognitive load is just that mental effort you need to use to maintain information in your working memory as you're trying to um, solve a problem. So the more that you have that you're trying to think about as you um, are learning something new, the more difficult it is to do. And uh, programming in particular is a very high cognitive load area because students are often trying to learn the syntax of a programming language along with a particular technique. Like I said, I'm learning how to do a method or work with arrays or lists. Um, and then trying to debug all of those things at the same time, like they don't know if it's they're getting errors because of it's their syntax or because of it's um, something going wrong in their prob um, program logically. And so our, our goal here is to reduce that cognitive load as much as possible so that it's easier for them to focus on particular um, particular points for that, that concept. So here's one example of how you might use a worked example. You could introduce the concept like, what is a method? Why would we want to use one? Then you could go through a worked example um, that shows how to create a method. And then maybe you would go through a second one to show a similar but a different version of it. And then maybe you might have students um, do something where they're asked to change or edit or manipulate the code that is already there. So um, with the example of the method, you could say, well, I want to print an array of strings, right? How do I write a method that prints an array of strings? Okay, what if I wanted this array to print an array of integers? How would I have to change it? So something along those lines where they still have the majority of the code to work with, but they're just looking at manipulating parts of it. And then finally, you might give them um, just a problem statement where they have to write a method from scratch for themselves. So that's one idea of how you might use worked examples um, in the classroom. Now we'll talk a little bit about using sub-goal labels with those worked examples. So as you're working through the example, um, you may or you may not be consciously talking about the steps that you're using to solve the problem. Depending on that problem, there may be a lot of steps. And if there are a number of steps, then there, that cognitive load increases, right? It's hard to remember all of those steps. So sub-goals is basically the idea that you're giving a name to a group of steps so that the students are focusing on those sub goals and not the um, overwhelming number of individual steps that make up the problem solving process. So that number of fewer steps um, reduces the cognitive load for them. 
It also provides them um, a mental model, and a mental model is just an explanation of someone's thought process about how something works. And if you remember earlier, you know, I was talking about we want um, novices, our students, to be developing mental models of how experts solve problems. And so this is one structured way to make that explicit. So I've given you an example um, from a research article on sub-goal labels and worked examples. And this one is, you know, not relevant to computer science, but is an example of a written one on how to make a cake. Our um, steps one, two, three, etc., that are listed, if you had to remember those individually, may be quite difficult. But if you label them, um, use the sub-goals in terms of combine the dry ingredients, combine the wet ingredients, etc., then it's easier to make, um, to remember that process. And then once you, I, you know, can identify the sub-goals, you can work on the individual steps that go into that. So. Uh, this is one technique for helping students and is going to be the focus of our unit discussion. So I'll have you read a research paper about using sub-goal la labels with worked examples in computer science. Um, our goal for this is really just to, um, you know, find and discover ways to help students solve our, um, in particular, algorithmic problems for this one, but to um, be better problem solvers um, and moving them from that novice to expert continuum a little bit further. Um, the, like I said, the discussion asks you to focus on that one particular strategy, but there are lots of strategies. Your book points out the, um, the techniques on, that are in a list on Wikipedia, which I've just put up for you here. You might be thinking um, or start thinking about when are some of these techniques good to use in the problem solving process. So for example, brainstorming might be an effective technique problem solving strategy when you're trying to identify the um, appropriate computational techniques to solve a problem. That would be kind of step two in the one that we looked at earlier. So again, the discussion is going to focus on one particular technique, but don't forget that there are multiple ways to um, you know, solve problems and that you want to be working with your students to help them understand problems through a variety of techniques.